Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year. This is Dr. Jamie Perry from the Maryland Department of Health, and we're glad you could join us this afternoon for our COVID-19 Technical Assistance for Schools webinar. All right, um, just to get through our webinar housekeeping, um, folks will be muted throughout the webinar. Please type your questions, as usual, into the chat box. Uh, for our Q&A, we will be pausing after our first couple of speakers to respond to any questions um, specific to the content they present. And then, uh, as usual, we'll have a, um, a more general Q&A at the end. Um, we will record the webinar and have it available as soon as possible uh, at the coronavirus.maryland.gov uh, uh, webpage where you can find these school resources. So our agenda is pretty full for this afternoon. We'll have a uh, start out with a school outbreak update, and that will be followed by a K-12 testing program overview and update. And then we'll um, have some uh, discussion of uh, uh, updated guidance for isolation and quarantine, followed by questions and answers. Our next webinar will be held on Thursday, January 20th, two weeks from today. So now I'm going to hand it over to Brian Bacchus, who's the chief of our Division of Outbreak Investigation, to give us an update on school outbreaks. Brian? Thanks, Dr. Perry. Uh, and uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, having me back to uh, speak at this uh, webinar. It's good to uh, talk with everyone again. Uh, and I hope everyone uh, had a good uh, holiday uh, break. Uh, I just have a few slides prepared um, to talk about some updates that were made to uh, school outbreak uh, definitions. Uh, I think uh, several of you on the call have already uh, received word of this through uh, local health departments, but did want to uh, uh, hop on this uh, webinar and uh, give uh, the update to the, uh, the whole group. So uh, with that, we can go on to the uh, next slide. All right, thank you. Uh, so as I'm sure everyone on the call is uh, already uh, familiar with uh, this. Uh, I've just posted our previous definition uh, to have for comparison, but this was a definition that we uh, started using in August of 2020 when uh, K-12 schools started going back to um, uh, school um, at the, the start of the 2020-2021 uh, uh, school year, and that had been the uh, outbreak definition, uh, which was based on a, a national, uh, nationally recommended definition uh, that um, we had been using ever ever since that time. So we had the two uh, confirmed cases in uh, COVID nineteen, uh, two cases of COVID nineteen um, in a, in a cohort with a fourteen day within a fourteen day period. Um, as long as the cases are uh, epidemiologically linked, but not household contacts. Uh, and then additionally, we had the school outbreak thresholds, um, which were the three or more. Uh, you know, concurrent cohorts um, or 5% of the uh, school population uh, testing positive within a 14-day period. So, uh, again, those were the definitions we had been using for uh, a year and a half. Uh, if you can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so, our revised definition that is in effect currently, uh, we started using this as of um, outbreaks that were reported on January 1st. Uh, that has been updated um, and expanded a little bit uh, to be made a little more specific. So uh, rather than two, it's been increased to three cases in a cohort. Uh, that is also consistent with changes that were made to the nationally recommended outbreak definition earlier in the school year. Uh, and then we did add some um, additional language I highlighted in red here, some uh, clarifying language that was requested by um, uh, different folks um, at local health departments, state health department, et cetera. So uh, that's why um, those, those changes are highlighted in red, but uh, it's not um, a significant departure from how these were already being handled in terms of the, the specified groups and um, clarifying the uh, epi link in the school setting. Uh, so in addition to that threshold, outbreak threshold being increased for the uh, individual cohorts, the school-wide outbreak uh, threshold was also increased from three to five. And so that change is also highlighted in red there. Um, but the rest of that remains the same, as does the 5% uh, threshold, which uh, just of note, more schools have been meeting 
um, in the recent weeks um, due to the surge of the combination of uh, Delta and, and now a lot of uh, Omicron um, COVID circulating. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And so just a few additional notes about this um, change. So outbreaks that were open under the previous definition will remain open until they meet the criteria to close. Uh, several of them uh, were able to close following the um, holiday break, uh, though some that were um, involving cohorts that continue to meet, such as like uh, athletics teams um, over the break um, are remaining open, as, as are some others. Uh, so as I mentioned, the outbreaks that open or reopen uh, after on or after uh, January 1st of this year will need to meet this new outbreak definition. Uh, and just a note that, that um, when we use uh, dates, we're referring to the report date. Uh, so I know sometimes um, with delays in testing and reporting, uh, some of the recent outbreaks that have been reported actually were from mid to late December, um, but uh, anything reported after January 1st will need to meet that new uh, outbreak definition criteria. So that's not based on onset or collection date or anything, um, just report date. Uh, and then uh, the final note there is that um, everyone, uh, I'm sure, is familiar with the uh, school outbreak dashboard on the MDH website that was revised as of yesterday to include, um, it's always included the outbreak definition, so there are a couple of notes now with um, uh, highlighting the, uh, the changes that were made and went, went into effect on January 1st. So... Uh, I think those are the only uh, notes I had here, um, and that is my last slide. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, I've got a couple questions in the chat for you. Uh, the first is, I think um, the the person is asking about the um, the new definitions and how do they translate for a school that has 100% overlap of co cohorts through one school day. I think that's relating to the. I'll see if I can go back here. Whoops. Relating to the, uh, oh, I can't go back. Oh, it did go back. There we go. Whoops. All right. This is what happens when the doctor is working the slides. There we go. Are you able to respond to that question, Brian? Uh, yeah, I'm reading. I'm trying to um, uh, understand the um, intent of, uh, or you know, what's meant by 100% overlap of, of cohorts in one day. Um, Karen, if you could clarify your question, we can move on to the next one for a moment, just so we can get some clarity on what she's asking. Uh, we have another question, um, which is, which this is sort of related. Does a cohort consist of a group of students generally confined to a single physical space, like a classroom, or does it refer to a grade level, which may include multiple classrooms in one school? Uh, so uh, it, it depends a little bit on what the uh, school is doing in terms of the uh, the cohorting uh, when possible. Um, uh, we you know do prefer to keep it to um, uh, a space or you know a, a specific group like um, one class um, uh, or a team or you know some sort of specific extracurricular activity, uh, and that that's possible um, or a lot easier for. Um, uh, you know, lower like elementary um, school students um, compared to um, the type of uh, class schedules and mixing that's going on in in middle schools and, and high schools. So um, uh, when that's not possible, uh, sometimes the um, the grades have to be treated like cohorts uh, themselves. But um, uh, when when possible, the um, a, a more specific um, defined group um, that isn't mixing uh, would be used. Okay, um, the next question I see is if our school meets the definition of a school-wide outbreak, do we have to transition to online learning? Uh, you don't have to. That's not um, uh, uh, necessarily going to be a, a requirement or you know, a recommendation or certainly not a requirement. It's, um, you know, those decisions um, 
are, are some that have been made uh, jointly by the local health department and the school, depending on the, um, the specifics of the situation. But um, simply meeting the school-wide outbreak definition does not um, raise to that, 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 that level by default. Uh, and it's often based on, yeah, the, the extent of the transmission, and then there are some just, uh, you know, logistical concerns, obviously, that, that schools have with um, uh, staffing ability um, uh, and, and things when there, when there is uh, that level of transmission um, in schools sometimes. Right, and I'll just add that the very last question in our school guidance document um, does give some criteria, um, uh, including the things that Brian mentioned about when a school might want to consider a pause in in-person learning. So I would um, encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, it looks like Sarah, uh, Karen, excuse me, clarified her that 100% was a very small school with students. I think it sounds like maybe it, um, a small school where students perhaps in one grade are mixing is what I'm, is kind of what I'm, you know, maybe not in all in individual cohorts or classrooms. So I think the question is, would that be, would, the, would that be, then that whole grade potentially be the cohort or the specified group? Yeah, again, I think, yeah, it depends on, um, uh, and I know there could be a lot of variations on how this is uh, implemented depending on the, the, the school size and, you know, different uh, time dynamics there. So um, uh, I think, you know, similar to the uh, answer to the question I gave, uh, a couple of questions back, it, it depends on the situation, but yeah, that is sometimes what we have to do is treat the, um, the broader grade as a, a cohort. There's also a question about how school case numbers are reported to the, the website, the person comments that the numbers don't seem to reflect the local numbers for a school site. Sure, uh, and um, uh, we've tried to uh, explain this. I know this question does come up, um, and especially there are schools that are keeping their own dashboards and what um, we, uh, the decision of what to post on the website um, uh, with our data, um, you know, it was made early on, and what we've been posting uh, since the beginning of the pandemic are um, uh, the outbreak-associated cases um, for the current school outbreak. So it's not we don't really define active cases for um, outbreak uh, purposes. Um, we um, would use the cumulative um, numbers for the current outbreak. Uh, so sometimes there are outbreaks, unfortunately, that do, uh, you know, go on for extended period of times, and so then the outbreak uh, totals, uh, the case totals for those outbreaks then would be, uh, you know, very high if the outbreak's been open, you know, from September, say, through in, until December. But um, the uh, number that's posted to the website would reflect the um, current total for the outbreak. And then if, if, if a new outbreak is opened uh, at that same uh, school, uh, the, the totals would start over um, at, at zero. So again, just being cumulative for, specifically for that outbreak. All right, thank you, Brian. So I'm seeing there's several other questions in the chat, and I just want to be clear that we will get to other questions later in the chat, or later in the webinar. The questions that we're trying to respond to now are ones that are specific to um, to school outbreaks. So I think at the moment I, I am not seeing any additional questions that are specifically related to um, related to outbreaks. I'm um, just trying to okay. check here. And actually, um, uh, I would like to just add on um, uh, sure. to that previous answer that uh, when we are talking about outbreak cases too, we're talking about cases that are specifically linked to the uh, affected cohorts that are experiencing the outbreak. So when it's just a cohort outbreak, um, uh, you know, say the eighth grade basketball team, uh, just throwing something out there, uh, we would um, count the cases that are only part of the um, that outbreak. Uh, and so there are, especially this time of year, right now, what's going on? You know, there are likely going to be other cases in the school, um, but if those cases aren't linked to the outbreak, um, they would not be included in our uh, totals on the website. Um, and I'm not sure if this question got answered. Sorry, I've been trying to keep an eye on the chat, but um, there's a question about when is an outbreak considered over? 
Sure. Uh, so um, for the cohort uh, outbreaks, it's when um, 14 days have passed without any um, uh, new cases of COVID. Uh, and then the school-wide uh, outbreaks, um, it depends a little bit on the um, uh, which of the criteria they, they met. Um, and we've revised this a little bit uh, just with the uh, number of school outbreaks. Uh, there were certainly some schools that were able to meet that school outbreak definition uh, and go 14 days without any new cases, but we know that is very difficult, especially for uh, the very large schools to, you know, not have any uh, cases in their school community, uh, especially at times when community prevalence is so high. Uh, and so what we've been doing more recently is um, just trying to make sure that the individual cohort outbreaks have closed within that school-wide outbreak, um, uh, and then closing those school-wide outbreaks at that point, or if it was met by the 5% um, the threshold, um, you know, making sure that it uh, remains under that 5% um, for the uh, for a two week period, so uh, there are a couple of different ways depending on how the um, the outbreak definition is is met. Um, but basically, um, for those school wide outbreaks, we're just trying to get to a point where we wouldn't be calling individual cohorts with uh, to to close out the school wide outbreak. That there wouldn't be something that we would consider, you know, an out, an outbreak in a cohort um, happening um, before we close it out. So. If that made sense, I apologize. All right, thanks, Brian. I'm not seeing any more outbreak-specific questions in the chat, I don't think. Hopefully, I didn't miss any. Um, so thank you so much for that um, update on the um, the, the outbreak uh, definitions. And if we uh, if we seem to have um, additional questions, we'll make sure that we uh, forward them to, to um, Brian and his team to get responses to folks. Um, on a future webinar. So thank you, Brian. Thanks, Dr. Perry. All right, so next I'm gonna hand things over to Meredith Schlesel. Um, Meredith um, is, leads our uh, K-12 testing program at MDH, uh, and she's gonna give us some um, updates on the program. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, happy New Year. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Um, nice to see you all again. Um, just to um, provide an overview, I hope you are all aware of the current K-12 testing programs that are in place right now, um, but we do have our screening testing program that provides um, routine, routine testing of asymptomatic and presymptomatic individuals, um, screening on a regular basis, and that brings in our testing vendors to the schools um, to provide on-site testing. And then our diagnostic testing program um, with the use of rapid antigen point of care tests or PCR tests to aid in diagnose, diagnosing um, symptomatic individuals and their close contacts. And so MDH is providing those rapid tests to the schools and um, with the use of PCR tests either through NACO Medical from the past year or through your own testing vendor. Next slide. And I think there's one more before. And so I, uh, I just wanted to provide a little bit of data of the of the participation in the testing programs uh, to date. So between um, August, since August and now, we have about um, a thousand schools and um, that have been participating in the programs and have across the two programs have conducted. Um, over a million tests within the state, which I think is pretty good. So congratulations to you all. And, and I think this uh, demonstrates how, how widespread this program is across, across the state. And to the right, you can see the breakdown across the different counties, um, as well as the, um, if this is for both public and, and non-public schools combined. So I think um, just demonstrates all of the efforts that are being done um, to date to make sure all the students and staff in the schools are, are safe and, and, and person learning can, can, can continue. Uh, next slide. So with that said, there's still time um, if you if your school or school system is not signed up for any sort of screening program, you are still welcome to do so. Um, we are highly encouraging schools um, to scale up their testing programs, especially as 
um, community, community transmission is high as it is right now for the CDC recommendation. Uh, the screening program students and staff can be tested. This really includes anyone that has an interaction with students. So it could be bus drivers, counselors, office staff, um, cafeteria workers, um, and it is free um, to to the state for both yes for both uh, public and non-public schools. This is the the form to sign up below. Um, we can provide it also in the chat for you for those who um, have not received this form before. And the con and the contacts also are provided below of our testing vendors. There are five as it stands: 2020 Gene Systems, Capital Diagnostics, Cyan Diagnostics, uh, Concentric by Ginkgo, and Mako Medical. Next slide. And I think as, so. As schools are ramping up their testing programs and um, even starting their testing programs with with Omicron and, and increasing community transmission. We do want to provide some key points in terms of just how to increase uh, participation in the testing program as parental consent is required. And so we really do encourage you to engage your school leaders, faculty, parents, groups, coaches, uh, to be ambassadors of the program, um, building your, your community, sharing why it's important for testing to take place, making it easy to register, providing those consent forms and registration links in your regular communications, whether it's weekly emails or, or during events, um, really having it easy to sign up is really um, the, the best way. And then continuously follow up each, each week, the vendors are able to add more and more people to um, the, their testing program. So if they're not tested this week, then they can register for the following and continue. So I think that um, just the continuous follow-up is really important as we're seeing now. Um, the increasing community transmission rates, it's really important to, to keep these, to scale up these testing programs and they can always be scaled back um, as needed. And so if you need any additional communication support, please, please let us know. And for those who are participating in the program, perhaps some people could include some tidbits in the chat of how the program is going and for those who, who may not be um, participating at this time. Um, next slide, please. And so for uh, ordering of point of care tests, um, this is just a, a reminder, please plan ahead to ensure um, you have enough supply. Uh, we see your emails. I know there is currently um, a delay in the distribution of the point of care tests, and um, we are working furiously to get these delivered to you. Um, so please note, um, we are we are definitely aware, and we are making sure that your orders are are taken care of. Um, this is the form below to um, to register and get those diagnostic um, test supplies. All orders received by, by 3 p.m. on Thursday, they will get added to the next distribution list. As I said, please, please note delivery is taking about two weeks. Um, email orders do not count. So if you send us an email saying, I need tests, we need a form, we will give you the form. Please make sure you fill out the form. And for PCR test supplies for diagnostic testing, um, please either reach out to uh, make a medical or through your own testing vendor. Next slide, please. And so we just wanted to provide some information on some other programmatic offerings that the vendors are able to do in addition to the screening program. So they are able, several of our vendors are able to deploy rapid response teams in the event of an outbreak. Um, we do suggest that if you are currently participating in the testing program to consult your testing vendor to do this and speak with them directly if there is a broader need for testing. If you are not currently involved, enrolled in the testing program, you can send us an email. We will put our email in the chat and then it's also at the end of the presentation. Um, if in the event you do need some one-off testing. Um, there are some specific criteria for deployment. We do not suggest this replaces screening testing, but we do understand that obviously outbreaks are occurring and additional support can be needed. Um, and so here is the criteria below of outbreaking involving two or more cohorts or many suspected close contacts, um, outbreak in a school with low vaccination rates, particularly with younger students, an outbreak with ongoing or uncontrolled transmission, 
and when the school is unable to conduct mass testing by its own means. And so we do ask to allow 72 hours for the vendors to plan. So they may be able to respond faster, but given the current schedules and, and already um, made commitments, um, we're due at, we're, we are asking for a little bit more time um, to have these events take place. Next slide. And one other programmatic offering I do want to note is that we are offering um, the provision of non-clinical administrative staffing support to help with your screening testing program. These are administrative staff that are able to help track consent forms, rosters, and testing attendance, support implementing of your testing schedule, assisting with navigation and check-in, assisting with parent communications, fielding phone calls, escorting students to and from the testing, assisting with communications, contact tracing, et cetera, and data entry um, for your testing program. To receive a sign-up form, please see the email here for mdhk 12 testing at maryland.gov. And we and you will need to be enrolled in the in the screening. Oh, sorry, this is there. Um, you will need to be enrolled in your screening testing program in order for for staff to support to to be received. But in your request request, we are asking please specify any fingerprinting or background check requirements and vaccination requirements. This is extremely important. If your school or school system has specific offices that they must go to, please let us know and this will expedite the process much quicker. Once the staff member is identified, we will communicate with you um, to confirm the start date. And please be sure your on-site point of contact has access to our check-in and check-out form so we can verify their time. Um, if you have any other questions, again, please um, send us an email and we can get back to you um, with any information regarding any of the, the testing program offerings. That's all I have for today. Yes. Thanks, Thank Meredith. You. So um, some of the questions in the chat have already been answered by another member of the K-12 screening team. So thank you for that. And I think several of the questions, just to reiterate, were related to how schools can get involved in the testing, the various testing programs. And um, for those questions, please, we're going to ask you to reach out specifically to the email that's on the screen right now. I do, Meredith, have a question about, um, there's a couple of questions about whether a CLIA license is needed in terms of the um, diagnostic, um, the diagnostic testing program. Yes, so we can put it in the chat, the diagnostic testing program guidebook, but in order to put to um, administer point of care tests on site, a CLIA waiver is required. Great, and, thank you. And then, and I see Kiki's response. The, um, in some instances, if you're working with already with a with a vendor, they may be able to help submit the application on your behalf as the um, as the lab quote unquote lab director, or um, you can identify a, a physician in, within the community. Um, okay, let's see. I'm having a little bit of trouble with the chat here. Um, there is a question, um, and I know you may not be able to answer this, Meredith, but if um, you may be able to direct folks to resources. There's a question about getting at-home tests, uh, tests and test kits for families. So at this time, the at-home tests will are being distributed directly through the local health departments. And so I would suggest going to your local health department website on where those are being uh, delivered or provided. Um, I do not have any updates specifically for uh, home tests in schools, but um, if there's any information, we will communicate that as, as we hear it. All right, great, Meredith. Thank you. I think um, all the questions have looked like they've uh, in the chat have been uh, answered. If folks have additional questions that we didn't get to that I missed, I apologize. And please reach out to mdh.k12testing at maryland.gov. Thanks so much, Meredith. No problem. Thank you, everyone. And yes, please do reach out if you have any questions. Um, and I just want to, and before we move on, I just really want to reiterate that this is a great resource um, that the state has to offer 
uh, both public and non-public schools. And we really hope, especially during this time of the surge, that schools will take advantage of this uh, in terms of it, uh, being another of the layered prevention strategies that can help keep students and staff uh, students and staff safe and identify identify cases more quickly, particularly with the um, the uh, you know the challenges in um, in uh, um, accessing uh, testing in some parts of the state, um, which MDH I will say is actively working on, um, but this is a an additional way to to provide testing resources uh, in your community. Dr. Perry, if I could just add one thing um, sure. for the school systems as well as the the private schools, but it is possible for for different for, to be a little bit flexible in terms of this testing. And so, for a school system, for instance, if you are interested in having sort of a fixed site test up setup that's not necessarily at one particular school, but on the weekends for staff or students to get tested, that's something that can be discussed with the vendors to potentially have in place. Um, as, a dish, as an additional resource for for the community, um, with the with the I know a lot of the fixed sites are coming up right now and getting built, but I mean these vendors are here and they are filling a large gap um, within the state, and so I think there are some other options. So just if you're if you're interested in any sort of alternate testing that isn't necessarily physically in the school, please let me know and we can see what the vendors are able to do. Thanks, Meredith. Okay, and uh, now I'll transition to our, our last topic for this afternoon, which is uh, MDH and MSCE uh, interim uh, guidance for isolation and quarantine. And uh, Rachel Nurse Baker is going to be um, running through this updated guidance with folks. Rachel? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just going to be going over the interim guidance that is going to be coming out this afternoon. Uh, MS, MSDE and MDH has uh, put together an interim guidance, uh, temporarily replacing the K through 12 school and child care COVID-19 guidance document from October uh, 2021. Uh, let, me, let me let me stop you there for a second, Rachel, and clarify. Mm -hmm. It's just replacing the isolation and quarantine guidance in that document. And this uh, interim guidance aligns with the new CDC quarantine and isolation recommendations for the general public, uh, which was released on January 4th, 2022. Uh, the CDC will be uh, releasing updates to their K through 12 guidance um, in addition to the um, recommendations they made for the general public. Um, they did, however, say that those general public recommendations do apply to uh, K through 12. They're just going to be updating their K through 12 guidance page. Um, schools can still use the MDH modified quarantine options uh, that are in our K through 12 school and child care COVID-19 guidance uh, if they were, if they meet all of the requirements for that um, quarantine that modified quarantine option. Next slide. So who needs to isolate? Uh, all persons testing positive for COVID-19 or having suspected COVID-19, regardless of vaccination status, should uh, isolate um, according to the following. Stay home for at least five full days. Uh, from the date of onset of uh, symptom onset, uh, if symptomatic, or from the date of uh, your positive test result, if you do not have symptoms. Day one is considered the first full day after your symptoms started, or the first full day after your positive test result, if you're asymptomatic. After five days, the a um, person with COVID should uh, test if they um, do not have any symptoms or their symptoms have improved um, and they don't have fever for at least 24 hours without medication, um, they can return to school or childcare if they can wear a well-fitting mask around others for an additional five days. If they are unable to wear a mask around others, they should remain home for a total of 10 days. Mommy. 
The following recommendations are for persons exposed to COVID-19 or a close contact. Um, these following people do not need to quarantine um, and they should uh, do the following, which I'll explain. Um, the following persons do not need to quarantine adults ages 18 and older who have received a booster <clears throat> a booster dose or completed the primary series of Pfizer within the last five months, Moderna within the last six months, or J&J within the last two months, and they are asymptomatic. Children ages 5 to 17 who have completed the primary series of Pfizer as recommended and are asymptomatic, and persons who have confirmed who had confirmed COVID within the last 90 days do not need to quarantine. However, they should wear a well-fitting mask around others for a total of 10 days after their last close contact. And they should get tested on day five after their last close, close contact. If that test result is positive or they develop symptoms, they should stay home and follow recommendation isolation guidance. If the test result is negative or they are unable to get a test, they should continue wearing a well-fitting mask for a total of 10 days after their last close contact. Next slide. The following persons should quarantine after a close contact with someone with COVID-19. Uh, all persons of all ages who are unvaccinated and any adult age 18 Rachel, if you're speaking, we lost you. Sorry about that. <laughs> I accidentally muted myself. Um, so the following persons need to uh, quarantine if they have a close contact with someone with COVID-19, uh, persons of all ages who are unvaccinated, adults ages 18 and older who have completed a primary series of Pfizer more than five months ago, Moderna more than six months ago and have not received a booster, and J&J &J over two months ago and have not received a booster. They should quarantine for at least five days after their last close contact. And if they have no symptoms, get tested on day after day five. If their test result is negative, they may return to school or childcare if they can wear a well-fitting mask for five days, uh, additional five days, totaling 10 days after their last close contact. And if they test positive, they should follow recommendations for isolation. If the person is unable to get a test, they may return to school if they can wear a uh, well-fitting mask after day five for additional five days, totaling 10 days. Again, if the person uh, tests positive or develops symptoms, um, they should follow recommendations for isolations. Anyone who is unable to mask around others for uh, five days after isolation or quarantine rather, sorry, um, should remain home for a total of 10 days since uh, from their date of last close contact. Next slide. And a note we, that is made in this uh, interim guidance, um, I know a big concern is uh, unmasking during um, lunchtime. Um, that is recommended uh, to remove the mask during lunchtime and during nap time. Um, however, this unmasked time should be minimized and physical distancing and ventilation should be maximized during these times. Um, people should not be participating in any other activities unmasked during that additional five days that they are um, not in quarantine or isolation. And I will take questions.
Okay, so we have a lot of questions in the chat and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can and folks should bear with me as I'm trying to get, get through them here. I don't have a great view of them. I'm going to start early because there were some questions in the early on that we didn't get to, we weren't able to get to. Once again, apologies for the delay for just a moment while I get the questions. Um, there was an early question about whether staff and students need a test to return after, um, after having COVID. Can you respond to that question, please? They do not need a test to return. However, they should uh, get tested after day five if they can. Um, actually, um, just, to, just to clarify, Rachel, so um, the CDC actually does not recommend testing for um, people who are um, who ha currently have COVID. They have some guidance that, so this is a little bit of a, a the, the recommendation for testing is for people who are exposed um, and either quarantining or not quarantining. Um, there, there is a recommendation to get a test um, at day five or after. The CDC does not specifically recommend getting the test for folks to leave um, after they are released from isolation or to release them for isolation, but they do have guidance around if a person chooses to get tested, what, um, what should happen. Uh, and I would refer you back to that, refer you back to the CDC guidance for that. <clears throat> There's a couple of questions here around um, folks are um, folks have indicated that they've had some some challenges in reaching local health departments um, for assistance. And um, um, what I will just um, mention is that the local health departments um, are are all um, very eager to assist you, um, but um, are obviously uh, having their hands full as you are dealing with this incredible COVID surge that we're having right now. So. Um, if folks, so I think one of the important things is to um, note that health department staff may not be able to respond right away. Um, and um, also we wanna make sure that you are uh, reaching out to the correct person. And so for the non-public schools in particular, there uh, each local health department does have designated a non-public school point of contact. And those folks and their contact information should be on the website. So I would make sure you're reaching out to the right person. Uh, and then lastly, um, if folks are still struggling to um, get a response, please um, feel free to uh, shoot Rachel uh, uh, an email and, um, and we'll make sure her email is in the chat and we will see what we can do to either respond to your question or facilitate communication with the local health department. Uh, let me see. I can't tell if this is a question or a comment. Sorry, folks. Uh, there's a question. Um, there's a question about whether the CDC and MDH will be clarifying that the, the I, I believe this is the new isolation and quarantine guidance is not appropriate for K-12 school settings. So, so just to be clear, this, the CDC has not released specific updates to their K-12 guidance yet. Um, they have indicated in their guidance for uh, isolation and quarantine guidance for the general public that um, as Rachel indicated that schools, um, that this guidance does apply to the school setting. They also provide a link for more information and I will just indicate that that link has not, that guidance has not been updated. So please don't rely on the information in that link. Um, it has not been updated. I believe there is a December 29th date on the top, but we confirmed with CDC that the only update made was that little box at the top that indicates that there had been new isolation and quarantine guidance released. So please be clear that the CDC guidance clearly states that it applies to K-12 settings.
A couple of these questions were, were answered in the, as we discussed the guidance, so I'm going to try to skip over them to get to ones that perhaps were not answered. All right, so I'm going to jump to the bottom um, so we can uh, start from there. Um, the question is about, um, there's a question about whether the five-day quarantine guidance is for students as well as staff. Um, can, you, um, can you please clarify that, Rachel? My understanding is that staff would be um, a part of the general public. Um, so that would be um, their guidance, but this is really for students. The interim guidance. Um, actually, the interim guidance is for is for is for students and staff for all K twelve um, personnel and staff okay. and students. Um, there's a question about guidance for a fully vaccinated student. Uh, who is continuously being exposed to a household member who is positive. Can you talk about when that person's um, quarantine, um, whether that person needs to quarantine? If the student is fully vaccinated, um, they do not need to quarantine according to this uh, guidance. Um, I'm going to go back to the... Um, the slide here. So if they, this is someone who tests positive, correct? That's a fully vaccinated student who is a close contact oh, with the household well, member. Oh, positive. Yep. Um, So uh, children ages five to 17 who have completed a primary series of Pfizer uh, as recommended and are asymptomatic do not need to quarantine. Um, however, they should wear a uh, well-fitting mask for 10 days after their um, last close contact with that person and get tested at least uh, five days after. Yes, of course, these folks who have ongoing exposure are always um, are always a little bit uh, are always a little bit tricky. Um, if the person is <clears throat> is not eligible for um, to not quarantine. So, for instance, <clears throat> if it was un it was an unvaccinated, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, student, the um, the guidance would be um, as we've done all along in the pandemic, <clears throat> excuse me, that their quarantine starts on the date of their last those contacts, so that might be the, the release date from isolation for the um, <clears throat> for the household member. The um, when the person doesn't need to quarantine, and, and in all these situations, let me I should clarify too. The CDC has has um, more language in their guidance than we included in ours, but there's there's guidance around you know masking around others, including at home, and we would certainly want to uh, encourage those those kinds of behaviors. But the um, even though that the the um, the student is being continually exposed, if they're fully vaccinated, um, they do not need to um, they do not need to quarantine. And um, you know, when they should test is, you know, is a, a, a question. I mean, ideally, you know, you might have them test more than once, but the test the testing is recommended, but the CDC also gives guidance around um, what what you know what should happen if a person um, is unable to get tested. And we wanted to, to um, so we want to make it clear that while testing is recommended, um, we understand that not all families are going to be able to um, potentially access testing. So we are endorsing the CDC's, CDC's guidance, CDC's guidance of what to do if a person cannot, um, cannot get tested um, after, the, the, after, after the five days 
um, after they've been exposed and they don't need to quarantine or being exposed and they are quarantining, if, that's, if that makes sense. Um, and yes, and just to clarify that um, if, if a person is unable to mask, then they are not eligible for the short, shortened isolation or the shortened quarantine period. Um, there's a couple questions here. I just wanted to, about child care, uh, I just, I will mention that the new guidance that will be released hopefully this afternoon, this will also apply to child care. Uh, Rachel, there's a question about uh, any isolation or quarantine needed for students or staff that are coming back from travel. The CDC does um, provide some recommendations regarding travel. Um, I'll put the link in the chat for you to um, review that yeah i'll just mention when um when our guidance um the guidance that's coming out does not have um does not address every single detail of the cdc's guidance and so we do refer people back to the cdc's guidance um for the general population for some issues that um that we don't cover in in our guidance <clears throat> I would add, though, that they do um, say that you should not be traveling uh, during your five day quarantine period or isolation period. Um, there's a there's a question about and this relates back to the issue um, around um, around the CDC, the, the guidance for whether someone should or should not be tested. Um, to get out to to get out of isolation. Um, so the question or the the comment is: After students contract COVID, should we expect them to test positive for up to 90 days? How can we make the distinction between a new infection and the lingering, i.e., months later um, infection? Um, the recommendation is that um, they shouldn't be testing uh, because they know that um, it is, again, like you mentioned earlier, uh, testing should not be used for um, determination of um, isolation or coming out of isolation. Um, but that is a, a possibility for them to test positive up to three months. Um, and so that's why they are part of the uh, group that does not need to quarantine. Um, if they do, you know, test positive within that 90 day period. Uh, let, let me just let me just provide some um, some clarification. I don't have the current the, the CDC language right in front of me, but the CDC does have. So the CDC has clear recommendations that are mirrored in our guidance for um, for the testing, um, having a test for persons who are exposed who do have to quarantine and who don't have to quarantine. Um, the CDC does not put a specific recommendation to test either for or against in the guidance around people who are isolating. They do indicate if someone gets a test, has access to or chooses to get a test, I can't remember the exact language, um, they provide some specific guidance on the, 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 uh, the best type of, what type of test to use, which I believe is an antigen test and um, and what to do, which is if the test is positive to um, to remain in isolation for another five days. Uh, but just to be clear, once again, I think my, due to the fact that people who um, have COVID can test positive for prolonged periods after um, after they uh, recover, um, that is my understanding um, for the reason why the CDC has not put a specific recommendation for or against testing. Um, to get to get out of isolation, and you will see that there is not a specific recommendation in our guidance uh, uh, to test either. I hope that's clear. Uh, 
Uh, one question is that um, from Dr. Brookmeyer is that they're applying the CDC isolation and quarantine healthcare personnel guidance and staffing capacity strategies to health room staff with the general population guidance be appropriate instead. You said for healthcare personnel? Yeah, they're applying the CDC's healthcare personnel guidance. They have different guidance for isolation and quarantine um, to the health room. So should the general population guidance be appropriate instead? If it's for your, it's for the health room staff, I would say if, um, I mean, I'm just looking at the um, the CDC's healthcare um, specific guidance, but I I, I think um, that if it's for your your nursing staff in your health room, um, it would be applicable. The the inter, the uh, interim guidance that we're providing would be applicable because it is for the um, K through twelve um, personnel. So, Dr. Brookmar, we generally have considered um, health room staff to be healthcare workers. So, um, you know, if you want to apply the um, the healthcare um, the healthcare isolation and quarantine um, guidance, then we don't think that's unreasonable. Um, and I apologize, I'm, I've scrolled through some of the questions. On to some of these. Um, there is a, a question about um, may, may, I'm assuming this is students, may students participate in high risk activities when they return? Um, if this is prior to 14 days, but I'm assuming it's prior to the 10 days with a well fitted mask. The, they can, but they can't, they can't participate uh, in. So, if, for example, uh, sports are banned. They should not be participating if they have to unmask at any point. Right. So we we would recommend that that um, that the only time um, that students who are returning after five days from quarantine or isolation, the only time that they should be unmasked uh, in the school setting is for lunch. So for any other activities um, uh, or extracurricular activities school-sponsored extracurricular activities, they need to mask. If they can't mask, um, for instance, wrestling, um, it's unsafe to mask. They should not be, um, they should not be participating for those additional five uh, days of their isolation or quarantine period. <clears throat> we, are, we also would recommend that, at, at least at this time, that they are, um, they are, they are masking. Um, the CDC has not made a distinction between indoor and outdoor, and so at this point, we would recommend that they are masking outdoors at recess as well. All right, it looks like we've reached our time for this afternoon. I apologize that we haven't gotten to all of the questions, um, or at least I'm not sure we have. We will we'll take a look um, at the chat and make sure that um, that we are we are able to answer any additional um, questions that we didn't get to uh, either personally or uh, on our next webinar in two weeks. Um, folks do have Rachel's email address, so please feel free to reach out to her if we didn't get your question today. Um, be on the lookout for the, um, the 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 updated guidance. It will come in the form of a memo, and it will be posted on the MDH. Um, uh, coronavirus.gov website um, next to uh, next to the current school guidance document, and we will also um, probably uh, either late today or early tomorrow send it out uh, in email.
platform. So thanks everyone for your attention and we will see you in two weeks.